Hi, welcome back. Let's start with the test. This is a test that almost every valuation class has, so might as well start with it. If interest rates go up, what happens to equity values? And I'll give you the choices. Equity value will decrease, equity value will increase, equity value will remain unchanged, or maybe any of the above depending upon why interest rates increased in the first place. Now at first sight, the answer seems obvious, right? If you think about any discounted cash flow model, when interest rates go up, discount rates go up. And if you hold all that's constant, value should go down. So and the answer seems to be A, but that answer is actually wrong. And in this session, I'd like to talk about why it's so dangerous to jump to conclusions about the relationship between interest rates and stock prices. I'm going to start off with, with a point I've made before, but might as well make again. When you think about interest rates, you often think about central banks. And in the US, you often think about the Fed. And in fact, at the start of this week, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed, was in front of Congress talking about the economy. And the papers were full of news stories about what he was saying about what the Fed would do to interest rates over the rest of the year. But the Fed's power to set interest rates is limited. And here's why. The only interest rate the Fed actually sets is the Fed funds rate. And it's a rate at which you, and, and none of us ever borrow at the Fed funds rate. It's an interbank overnight borrowing rate. It is true that the Fed funds rate is related, is correlated with short-term interest rates. In fact, in this, this table, what I've looked at is the current period where the Fed has been raising the Fed funds rate. Starting in December of 2016, the Fed has been raising the Fed funds rate in the U.S. And you can see as the Fed funds rate has gone up, you can also see T-bill rates have also gone up. I'm not telling you anything about direction. I'm not saying the Fed is raising short-term rates, but the two seem to go up. The relationship with long-term rates is much, much weaker. Long-term rates have drifted up over that period. And they were, but during the period, you can see there were months where the Fed actually lowered the Fed funds rate or raised, raised the Fed funds rate and T-bond rates actually went down. So when we think about the Fed setting interest rates, we've got to step back from the precipice of assuming that the Fed actually can make the rates whatever it wants it to. Let me add to that proposition. If you think about what it is that drives interest rates over time, it's not the Fed that is the key driver, it's macroeconomic fundamentals. In particular, two variables drive the level of interest rates. One is expected inflation, the other is real growth. In fact, if you add up the inflation rate and the real growth rate each year, you come up with what I call an intrinsic risk-free rate. And over the last 50 plus years, you can see that that intrinsic risk-free rate has been very close to the actual risk-free rate. I've broken this down by sub-periods, but you can see across the periods when inflation and real growth are high, interest rates are high, and when they both drop off, interest rates become low. In fact, for those who believe that the Fed has been what's kept, has been keeping rates low for the last decade, my answer is not really, because it's low inflation and anemic growth that are more to blame for low interest rates than what the Fed has. I am a realist. There is a Fed effect, and that Fed effect is captured here by taking the difference between the T-bond rate and that intrinsic risk-free rate. And you can see the Fed does have an effect, but not as much as we attribute, um, uh, as we attribute to it as power. Here's some more evidence that the Fed follows markets and does not lead them. Here's what I did. I took data from 1962 through 2018, monthly data on the, Fed, the change in the Fed funds rate, the change in the T-bill rate, and the change in the T-bond rate. And I looked to see what the relationship between the three was. When I looked at the contemporaneous relationship, in other words, the change in the Fed funds rate and the change in interest rates in the same period, it is true that t rates and Fed funds rate move together. There's a, the R squared is almost 56.5%. The relationship between Fed funds rate and long-term treasury rates are much weaker. The R squared is only 6.7%. But then I wanted to see direction. Does the Fed set short-term interest rates or do short-term interest rates drive the Fed to act? To test this, I did a very simple follow-up. I took the change in the Fed funds rate and I looked at what happens to T-bill rates in the next month and T-bond rates in the next month. If the Fed drives interest rates, you should see changes in the Fed funds rate leading to higher T-bill rates, higher T-bond rates in the following period. You actually see the R-squared drop off when I look at what happens to interest rates in the following time period. Then I reverse the effect. 
What do I mean by reversing the effect? I look at I looked at the change in interest rates in a month and what the Fed did in the next month. And here I found something interesting. I found that when T-bill rates went up, it was far more likely that Fed funds rates would go up in the next month. And if T-bill rates went down, that the Fed funds rate would go down. What do I read out of this? It's a very preliminary analysis, but based on this monthly data, at least, it looks like the Fed is less market leader than market follower. So when, as you look forward, if you want to make judgments about interest rates, you're welcome to watch the Fed. But I think you'd be better served looking at what happens to real growth and inflation because that's what's going to drive, especially the long-term rates, what, drive, what, what happens to long-term rates in the future. My second point in this session is that the relationship between interest rates and value is complicated. And here's why. If you look at the drivers of value, there's cash flows in the existing period, the value of growth in the future, you have a discount rate that comes from looking at a risk-free rate and an equity risk premium, and you tie up loose ends with the terminal value. And the numbers as they stand now reflect where we are. An equ a, a T-bond rate of about 2.87%, an equity risk premium of roughly four, you know, 5%, but if you look at history, it's about 4.77%. And the numbers today reflect essentially what we see out there in the market. So when you think about value, you're thinking about all of these variables. You're saying, so what? When you think about the three big drivers of value on that, in that table, one is the T-bond rate, the second is the equity risk premium, the third is earnings growth and the cash flows you get from that earnings. And almost every big macro variable affects all three. Let's take a couple of examples. If your story is about inflation going up, okay, inflation going up is going to increase the T-bond rate. We've seen the relationship between the two is strong, but inflation going up is also going to have an effect on earnings growth, and historically, higher inflation has sometimes led to higher equity risk premiums. So if inflation is going up, it's not just the T-bond rate that's increasing, it's the T-bond rate, it's earnings growth, it's equity risk premium. If your story is about real GDP growth, higher real GDP growth will push up the T-bond rate, will also push up earnings growth, and it's historically higher GDP growth has often gone with lower equity risk premiums. And finally, if you talk about a market crisis, what does a market crisis do? It causes the equity risk premium to jump, right? And at the same time, a market crisis will often cause T-bond rates to drop and earnings growth to become less. And the history of the day uh, when you look at this reflects this correlation. What I've looked at here is earnings growth rates, you know, real GDP growth inflation and an equity risk premiums going back to 1961. And if you look across time, you see something very interesting kick in, basically backing up what we said before. Higher inflation has gone with higher earnings growth. It's pushed up the T-bond rate and pushed up equity risk premiums. Higher real growth has led to higher earnings growth and lower risk premiums. What does this all tell us? If you're going to tell me a story, and, I, and this is my third and final point about the market, that story has to be consistent. You can't just take a piece of the story and build your valuation around a piece. So you can't just talk about higher T-bond rates and forget about the rest. So one of the things that builds, builds ba a base to evaluation is a good story, a consistent story. You're saying as opposed to what? Here are two inconsistent narratives or incomplete narratives. The last few weeks, I've seen market strategists and some equity research analysts present, and these are bearish analysts, present what I call the interest rate story. The interest rate story is what happens. The T-bond rate pops to 4.5%, but everything else in the process stays unchanged. I don't know how this happens. How can T-bond rates go up and nothing else change? Something's causing those rates to increase, right? It's an incomplete story, but not surprisingly, if you just raise rates and leave earnings growth and equity risk premiums unchanged, stock prices are going to collapse. At the other end of the, the, the spectrum, you have a bullish narrative built around growth and just growth. So in this story, earnings growth pops. Why? Because there are tax cuts. There's good stories about the economy, but nothing else changes. Risk premiums don't change. T-bond rates don't change. Not surprisingly in this story, the value just pops after the earnings growth goes up. Neither of these stories is complete. You're saying, what would a complete story look like? Here are three potentially complete, consistent stories leading to very different conclusions. The first story I'm going to call more of the same. For much of the last decades, we've had tantalizing hopes that we're going to break out of the crisis mode. 
Since 2008, we've been stuck in developed markets with low growth, low inflation, and equity risk premiums, which are pretty high. So every couple of years, we have hoped that this time we're going to break out of that, that problem. And here again, we're in 2018, we're talking about how this time will be different. Maybe it's not. So there are some who believe that we're going to revert back to what's been true for much of the last decade. What does that mean? Earning growth is going to be much lower than people are anticipating. It's going to be only 5%, and much of that is going to come from the tax cut in the first, and then you're going to revert back to the low growth we've seen for the last decade. The T-bond rate is going to drop back to 2.5% because inflation is going to fade and real growth is going to fade. And equity risk premiums are going to revert back to what they've been for much of the last decade, which is close to 5.5%. If you believe that the level you get for the index is about 2251, this is the S&P 500, which would make it about, eight, you know, at given current prices, about 16 to 17% lower than where it is today. Here's a second story, and it's an inflation story. In the inflation story, inflation returns. It shows up as a higher T-bond rate because that inflation feeds into your T-bond rate. And I'm talking about inflation of 3% maybe. So T-bond rate of 4%. But that higher inflation also pushes up equity risk premiums. Remember, historically, high inflation has gone with higher risk premiums, especially as it climbs. So the equity risk premium is 6%. I leave the earnings growth at 7%. And I let the earnings growth go to the 4% I've assumed the T-bond rate to be. With the inflation story, the value that I get is 2133. Lower than what I got with more of the same, and in fact about 20% lower than where the index is today. There's a third story, and this is the growth engine story. In this story, it's real growth that kicks in. And when real growth picks up, to be realistic, your T-bond rate will also go up to about 3.5%. Your equity risk premiums, though, are going to drop because if real growth returns to healthy levels, equity risk should start to subside. Equity risk premiums drop to 4.5%. And earnings growth is going to be marginally higher than analysts are projecting because the real economic growth is going to kick it into a higher gear. The value that you get if you make these assumptions for the S&P is over 3000 the index is undervalued by almost 15 to 16% if this story kicks in. Now, it's not fair for, you to me, for me to present three different stories and not tell you where I stand. So I'll give you my melded story because it steals from each of the other three stories. I do believe that there's going to be a kick up of earnings growth for the next five years, much of it coming from the tax cut in the next couple of years. I do believe the T-bond rate will climb. It will continue to climb to 3.5%. And I think we're going to settle in an equity risk premium around 5%. With those assumptions, the value that I get for the index is about 2609, 2610, which is, about, which is within shouting distance of where the index is today. That's very convenient to say for somebody who's not a market timer. Hey, you're right. I think it's a very convenient place to be, and it's the most comfortable place for me to be because I am not a market timer. So what is the, bar what is the bottom line? You will hear a lot of half-baked narratives out there. Half-baked narratives, people will hold everything else constant, talk about one variable. Don't believe them. Look for the rest of the story. Second, as you listen to other people's narratives, don't buy into any of them, including mine. Build your own narrative. You're investing your money, and if you're investing your money, you need to do it on your storyline. And three, be open to feedback. Feedback from markets, feedback from data. You're constantly you're going to hear from markets, and as you hear back, Fine-tune your story, adjust your story, and if necessary, be willing to abandon your story. It's, uh, it, 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 it is going to be a rocky few months as the market adjusts to a new reality, but I think we can navigate it if we can think seriously through every aspect of our stories. Thank you very much for listening.